Hi, and welcome to Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara, Week 1, Episode 2. Hello. We're going to start by summarizing Episode 2, which we just watched. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to group the storylines together rather than trying to go through the whole episode. That's a good idea. Um, Well, we start with the bus station uh, and the helicopter, and... Peebo Bryson's If Ever You're In My Arms Again, as Mm -hmm. the camera alternates between Kelly and Joe. Uh, Joe gets off the bus, and uh, he has to be escorted in by two police officers, because there's such a big crowd. Santana's got her gun. Rosa's not able to find Santana. And uh, Joe comes in, and Rosa spots Santana, and she drops the gun. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before she can pick it up, Mason steps on the gun and stops her from doing something stupid. I thought that was surprising, actually, that he just, he seemed to show up out of nowhere. There was nothing to indicate that he was following them or or anything like that in the previous episode. Yeah, I mean, either he was at the bus station to see how things were going and just happened to spot her, or he Mm -hmm. had followed her there from the house where she stole the gun. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, he takes the gun back home and puts it back in the drawer in the study. And Cece doesn't seem too perturbed by that. No. Meanwhile, back at the bus station, uh, Joe and Marissa and Jade, instead of immediately leaving to get away from the protesters, they have a little sit for a while, chat. Yeah, they just so. sort of settle in at the bus station and let the police uh, escort the crowd out, out the door. And skulking in the corner is the mysterious dragon lady who previously had set her thugs on Joe in the last episode. Uh, Joe and the family finally decide to go home, and uh, John is not really that interested in greeting his son. Um, The episode has them at odds the entire time. Eventually John blows up and says that the family was nearly bankrupted by the trial, and... uh, They had to take out a second mortgage to pay for the lawyers, and uh, he ends up really angry at Joe, and Marissa tells him to, he tells Joe to leave the house, but Marissa tells him that he should be the one to leave. We actually do get a little bit of insight uh, into that, into what really sparked that fight and uh, John's attitude, because he does actually have a meeting with... um, with C.C. Capwell while all the commotion is going on at the bus station and C.C. Capwell in a in a very sort of sinister way indicates that uh, he needs to try and get Joe out of Santa Barbara and uh, that if he doesn't keep Joe away from Kelly and uh, kind of keep uh, Joe from interfering in general that uh, the family might be Threatened. He, I think he mentions that he once gave John yeah. a job. Yes, so. that's right. So that that actually made the connection between the two as well. So I'm not, we're still not sure what Capwell Enterprises does. No. Or what kind of job John would have done for CC. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much uh, their whole episode. It's just their their family, and uh, I have to say, I kind of find that family a bit boring after only two episodes. I think everyone's waiting for Joe and Kelly to encounter each other, but I think they're going to drag that out a little while longer. I think so. Because Peter and Kelly uh, land on their private island and then get a dinghy out to the private yacht. That's and su- that surprised me, actually, that this big helicopter ride, which uh, ended the last episode and, and started this episode, uh, ended in them getting in a dinghy. That actually was not what well, the dinghy ended up going to a fancy yacht, so they um, spend the whole episode swimming and chatting, but uh, Kelly's kind of quiet at times, and she doesn't say it, but obviously it's she's thinking about Joe, but Peter's uh, not really able to... She's, she's not really that interested in Peter, I would say. I guess not. She does mention one thing new, though. She mentions that they used to go on the yacht every Mother's Day, even when after Mum died. Mm. So, so now we know what happened to so Mum. Now we know what happened to Mrs. Capwell. 
Um, meanwhile, after coming home from the bus station, Rosa questions Santana about why she's so upset, and uh, she thinks it's odd that she's a Five years later, still upset about Channing, you know, being shot when they, you know, they barely knew each other. And then she says, well, we were more than friends. And then it turns out that she and Channing had been together for months, but they'd been hiding it. And then she reveals that she, she had uh, been pregnant with Channing's baby and that Cece had arranged for her to go to Acapulco for the summer to work at their summer house. And uh, has she'd had the baby there, so uh, and she didn't actually say what happened to the baby after that. But, I don't uh, think she knew. I think uh, from the ad we saw a couple days ago, she said they took my baby. So uh, it did seem it sort of stretched uh, my belief a bit that she'd managed to keep all of that from her mother for all those years, since they seemed to be living and working together. Well, she said, you know, the, the way she was brought up, I assume Catholic, mm -hmm. that she just didn't want to, 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 you know, incur the wrath of, if not her mom, then her dad. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ted and Lakin uh, continue their adventures. Ted uh, sneaks onto the Lockridge property and climbs up the trellis to Lakin's window. And... Uh, she uh, she is uh, just to hide him under the bed when her mom comes in, and uh, it's revealed that her mother is actually the dragon lady that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, she comes in with her dog Breeze that we met last time, so that we're quite sure that it's her. A Doberman Pinscher, so we can tell that uh, she means business. Yep, and her name is Augusta Lockridge. Mm -hmm. And she does not spot Ted under the bed. No. Breeze uh, seems to detect him, but doesn't raise the alarm. So for a Doberman Pinscher, maybe he's not that good of a guard dog. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ted manages to hang out there for a while and then leaves through the window without ever being detected. Then just at the end, Minx Lockridge spots him landing on the sidewalk and... She seems to have a bit of a smile on her face. I mm -hmm. don't think she's going to give give it away to Augusta that Lincoln's been seeing Ted Capwell. Well, um, Minx and Lincoln seem to have a bit of a connection, and I think they often uh, confide in each other and, and uh, sort of, I don't know if protect is too strong a word, but they seem to conspire with each other a little bit. Uh, yeah, Augusta, Augusta seems to be a very yeah. stern woman, yeah. a very stern mom, so she uh, wouldn't like the fact that she was questioning her about why she was at the beach for more than an hour. Yeah, she so. seemed... And Lincoln, you know, confided in Grandma that she'd gone to the Capwell party and they'd spend the whole night dancing in the stables. And yeah. Mix yeah. didn't, uh, didn't seem too bothered by that, just... Just more chiding her choice of a Capwell, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. And, uh, and that was, I think, pretty much it for the plot. So, Louise Sorrell is playing Augusta Lockridge. So, that is someone... The name I've heard. ...that I'd, n I'd never heard of before. I'd originally seen Santa Barbara, but mm -hmm. since... Uh, I'd seen, I've seen her since on Star Trek, mm -hmm. uh, which I hadn't seen as a kid. And, and then... Uh, of course, now lately we've been watching Mannix and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and Ironside and all these shows, and we see Louis Sorrell popping up in a lot of those old shows from the late '60s, early '70s that right, we've been watching, yeah. um, almost as often as Jessica Walter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, of course, she played Vivian Alamein uh, several times for quite a long time on Days of Our Lives. Mm -hmm. So you may have spotted her once or twice. And I don't think we met any other new characters. Uh, I think that was other the than big Augusta's reveal. reveal. Yeah, and she was actually in the previous episode. So, but uh, from the closing credits, they had the entire cast there, and there are at least two names in the credits that we haven't met yet. So uh, I believe one of them will show up tomorrow. Oh, that'll be exciting. Yeah. So. Uh, and of course, this episode that. ended with John giving Joe the dire warning to keep away from Kelly Capwell. Yeah. 
So obviously they're going to have They'll to end up meet. together at some oh. point. And San Quentin is actually north of San Francisco. Oh. So he would have to pass through San Francisco to get to Santa Barbara. All right. So it's only about 40 kilometers north of the Golden Gate Bridge. So we probably drove by it. So, all right. Join us again tomorrow as we watch episode three of Santa Barbara. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Welcome back to Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Welcome back. We've watched Santa Barbara episode three, and we're going to summarize it. Yes. So, Mason and Santana uh, had some interactions today. Mason shows up at her at her uh, apartment uh, and tells her that, uh, you know, some witnesses have come forward to say they saw her with the gun at the bus station and that, uh, you know, with his pole as the assistant DA, she's really going to need him. Mm -hmm. Clearly, he's interested in Santana... For romantic reasons. And very clearly she is not interested in him. She ends up calling a friend of hers, um, a lawyer, and he's uh, he says he'll look into, into exactly what witnesses there are, because mm -hmm. she tells him that she can't really believe Mason. Anyway, she had agreed to meet him for breakfast, so mm -hmm. when they do meet for breakfast, they're both drinking Bloody Mary, so I guess that's the Santa Barbara breakfast. <laughs> And uh, Mason uh, says he's going to make a call to find out about those witnesses. He goes to the phone booth, and he, he only just checks with his secretary on his upcoming lunch uh, meeting and doesn't mention the witnesses at all. And then no. comes back to Santana and says, good news, I don't think uh, any of the witnesses are going to come forward. So he's clearly making up this story just so he can spend time with her. Mm -hmm. And uh, they end up going back to her place, and uh, she says uh, she's going to take a nap, so he uh, he says he's going to leave, but uh, she leaves the door to the bathroom ajar, which appears I to don't... be purposeful. Yeah. And then he, on his way out, looks back and sees that uh, she's done that, and he ends up closing the door and heading towards the bathroom. So. That's... It's very foreboding. I think that um, after he came back from just checking in with his office, I got the feeling she was really at that point done with him and ready to just call it a day because she basically tries to call the lunch short and then he decides to, to take her home. So I guess I was a little surprised that she just left him there to see himself out. I think I would have made sure he had left if I was anxious to not spend time with him. Well, Mason did say, you know, something about uh, what had happened between them in the past. Yes, we don't know what that was. I don't know what that was. I don't know if this is related to the very first episode where they showed the party five years earlier, if mm -hmm. Channing and Mason were both interested in Santana back then, or if it's a completely unrelated thing. I'm wondering if Santana's maybe realized that perhaps if she leads Mason on, mm -hmm. he might be able to help her figure out where her child is. Oh, that is because sneaky. yeah, maybe that's she's possible. got that in her head now. Now, now that Rosa knows, mm -hmm. she knows her. It's only a matter of time before her dad finds out, and they'll probably both be interested in in meeting their grandchild. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that could be. That could be what she's thinking, unless she's interested in Mason. I mean, that's possible. I didn't too, get the feeling she was. No, from the first three episodes, I didn't. Think it wouldn't that surprise either. me if she's playing him in some way to get what she wants. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, last time Rosa found out about the the baby, so she goes to see Cece, and uh, she confronts him with the fact that uh, he had. Uh, gotten Santana to give up the baby, and mm -hmm. Cece's defense was, well, Channing was only 18, and he, uh, he had dreams for him to become president, and that couldn't really happen with Santana mm -hmm. involved, so that's kind of a racist uh, um, attitude of Cece's, even though Rosa's worked for him for 20 years, uh, he does not see his son with... Uh, 
with the maid's daughter. Well, that's, I didn't. I didn't necessarily read that into it, although mm. that's certainly possible. I was thinking just the idea of having kind of a, an out of wedlock um, affair that resulted in a in a baby. Yeah, that seemed quite concerning too. The yeah. Out of wedlock baby. Yeah. I guess in 1984 that was still, um, you know, a lot, a, a big. Or it might have been, or or also it might have been a thing in that class too, because it might not just be a racial aspect, it might be a class aspect. Who want, would have wanted his son to marry a certain type of person in a certain type of social sphere, which obviously would not be the daughter of his maid. Mm -hmm. That could be. That could be. We may find out more about Cece's feelings on the matter. But I certainly think Rosa had the right to be upset about the whole thing, and uh, especially since, as she says, she basically raised Cece's children after his wife died. So she would, I, I don't blame her for assuming she would have a little bit more consideration than that when, when something came up, especially something involving her own daughter. Mm -hmm. So that's going to you know, move forward. Um, and elsewhere... Ted and Danny are at the beach uh, working on a hang glider that Danny plans to jump off of uh, a cliff in order to impress Jade Perkins. Mm -hmm. um, Jade shows up shortly after and uh, she seems semi-interested in Danny, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, Warren Lockridge shows up. Now he's obviously a bit older than them, but uh, it's not entirely clear if he's, uh, you know, he was ribbing Danny about his hang gliding skills. It's mm -hmm. not entirely clear if that's just because he's interested in Jade too, or he's just a jerk. Yeah. Or he's got some other reason not to like Danny Andrade. He's so. definitely portrayed as a potential rival for Jade. So he's a lifeguard there. He mentions he's not going to rescue Danny if he crashes into the ocean <laughs> and and uh, he does seem to flirt with Jade a little bit uh, mm -hmm. after Danny does do the hang gliding. And then Jade uh, has a talk with Ted and says that he knows that uh, she knows he's interested in Lakin and she'll call mm -hmm. Lakin to the uh, she'll call Lakin to the beach. Yeah, and she does show up. Um, meanwhile, around the same time, a movie producer shows up just out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere, saying what an amazing hang gliding uh, feet and she wants Danny to repeat that for a movie that she's shooting called California 84. Oh. And Jade sees um, movie star bells or whatever the phrase is. She's, she's, she's stars. seeing stars and yeah. she's trying to figure out if she can somehow glom onto this uh, thing and go to Hollywood with Danny and maybe also be in the movie. Mm -hmm. So she spent some time trying to figure out uh, how she can propose to the to the uh, casting lady that she should should tag along. So uh, that is obviously a ramp up to a summertime story for the teens. I actually really enjoyed that whole thing because I was probably around that age when this was airing. And uh, last last episode, we saw Lincoln's bedroom and. She had all these posters of Culture Club and some of the big bands from 1984. Um, so it was just kind of fun to see these kids at the beach, and, and I actually really enjoyed that. I yeah, that I think they said Jade yeah. was 17, I think. Yeah, yeah. So that's, so, yeah, I was 17, I guess. A little older 15. than me, but yeah, it was, I, I thought that was fun. But then, she does seem to lose interest at the very end, doesn't she? Jade? Yeah, she goes off and follows uh, Warren off off stage. Yeah, so. yeah. So it's like she decides that actually at the end of it all, Warren is more interesting than a potential Hollywood career or Danny. So. Yeah, unless he's just playing with Danny. It's hard maybe. to tell. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. We'll find out more next episode, I'm sure. Oh, one thing that uh, happened while Rosa and Cece were, uh, were talking, Cece was on the phone when Rosa came in and he, he was telling someone to shut down rig number... 27. 
Capwell 27. Right. So I'm envisioning one of those oil rigs off the coast of California. Like the zero oil derricks to drive yeah. through when you're in Los Angeles. So I think the Capwells are in oil, so that's another dynasty link. Well, and also I think um, when John marched out in the last episode, he was he was talking about, or maybe when he met with CC, they were talking about the oil rigs. Ah, I didn't catch that. Yeah. So. And his name is Capwell, so he must that's be an oil man. That's a name for an oil man. Yeah. If you're not going to be a Ewing, yeah, then you might as well be a Capwell. Capwell. Yeah. Um, the Perkins family, um, well, you know, John Perkins has left the house in the last episode, and so Joe and Mom and Jade are at home, and Mom's wondering why Jade hasn't gone to the beach yet, and she goes, oh, I think you, you might need me, but mm -hmm. she and Joe managed to convince her to go to the beach. Um... Joe and his mom talk a bit, and he's he's adamant about going to see Kelly, and then uh, Dad comes home, and he and the wife have a creepy conversation. It was very creepy. <laughs> yeah, it was about it was all about how now that he was no longer living at home, because remember he marched out at the end of last episode, he was no longer getting his needs met. So, obviously referring to intimate needs. I guess. And then he starts saying, oh, you know, without all my money coming in, you know, you're not going to be able to buy anything or pay your yeah. bills. So. It was very, very unpleasant. Very made, odd. made me wonder why they'd stayed together at all. Actually. Yeah, I think he mentioned they'd been together 20 years. So. Yeah. And uh, so Joe ends up going out and going to the, to the airport mm -hmm. or wherever the Capwell chopper pilot hangs out and manages just to trick him into telling telling Joe where uh, Kelly and Peter went mm -hmm. um, so but then the guy quickly realizes he's Joe Perkins and and uh, Joe says oh don't worry I won't tell anyone that you told me but the guy makes a phone call anyway at the end so yeah uh, Joe ends up going out uh, uh, out to the uh, the harbor to wait for the yacht to return so Meanwhile, with Kelly and Peter, um, they're on the yacht, and Kelly, Kelly apologizes for last night. So what I'm thinking was, like, I'm not quite clear, but is it possible that they haven't had sex and that that was the first time they were going to have sex? I don't know. I mean, it definitely seemed to me that the entire setup of them being on this romantic trip on the yacht for, I think it was supposed to be several days was supposed to be a romantic interlude. Yeah, and some of the dialogue leading up to that made me think like maybe they were going to be together for the first time, but they mm -hmm. weren't. And so now I'm thinking, you know, with Joe in the picture, that may not be happening at all. But, yeah, maybe. But. Kelly definitely does seem to be getting less and less interested in Peter with each passing episode. Mm-hmm. She says to him, she doesn't want to feel guilty about last night. Mm. But then he says, very reassuringly, assuringly, I'll never let you go. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. There's a lot of creepiness, actually, on the last episode between Mason and John Perkins and then Peter. And Peter. Yeah. Peter. I mean, Peter not generally coming off as creepy yet, but... You just think of, well, you've seen other fiction things, yeah. And the guy who's an obstacle to the to the leading man always turns out to be a jerk in some way. So yeah. you kind of know that something is is going to happen. We'll with find Peter. out. We'll find so out. Things will happen, and uh, I think that's it for. For what happened. Well, of course, the episode ends with Joe Perkins having a confrontation with C.C. Capwell. That's right. Right outside, I guess, on the property, actually, of, of the Capwell estate. C.C. says he'll have him arrested and that'll violate his par parole. Yeah. And uh, he says he's going to prove to them that he didn't kill Channing. Mm -hmm. And then he also mentions he's going to see Kelly. So that's, <laughs> that's something C.C. is... Is not too happy about it. So. Yeah, Joe's not playing it safe at all. Um, 
I'll be interested to see when he is no longer wearing his prison shirt. Mm. Because he still seems to be wearing his prison shirt. And it's day two, hasn't it? Yeah. I'm sort of, I would have thought they would have another shirt at his place for him. So Joe goes uh, to the to the docks then with the binoculars and mm -hmm. manages to spot the yacht. He's very good at, at uh, spotting Kelly from miles away, as we know from the, the bus station. And um, meanwhile, Kelly's uh, Peter's driving the boat, so Kelly's just frolicking around on the deck, and uh, probably thinking of Peebo Bryson, which we heard a lot of this episode too. And then Joe, either Joe or Kelly, had a flashback to, I think it was Kelly had a flashback. Yes. To seeing Joe with the gun standing over Channing's body. Yeah. Which obviously, you know, is what led to her testifying against him. But Joe had said, I think, to his mom that her testimony, you know, can be explained. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, one other thing that uh, I forgot to mention last time or maybe even the time before, but Lakin uh, talks about a Capwell-Lockbridge feud briefly. So yes. that's some backstory that, you know, kind of explains Minx's feeling toward the Capwells. Now we did get a very brief look at Lincoln this episode too. Just she came and joined Jade and, and Danny and Ted down at the beach really briefly. That's really all we saw. Mm -hmm. Ted asked her how her trellis was after he'd yeah. fallen down it, and she said she hadn't dared to look yet. So Yeah. And that's about it. That's about so it. So we will return for episode four. Hi, it's August 2nd, and Mish and Diane have just watched Santa Barbara. Hello. Week one, episode four. Mm-hmm. And... The show started with a bomber. It was a very dramatic beginning. The first shot we saw was of a bottle of very fine gunpowder. So we knew something was going to happen. And some mysterious figure was working on a pipe bomb. Then cut to Santana's place. Mm -hmm. She's getting ready for her bath. Mason's still skulking around in her living room. Yeah. And she spots him. And so, apparently this wasn't a place. She didn't know he was there. I guess not. I guess she had heard the door close and thought he'd left. So anyway, he gets super creepy. Yeah. Says, you didn't think I was going to rape you. Which is just, <laughs> you know, what you want to hear. And the weirdo's in your living room. So anyway, she manages to get rid of him. Yeah. Then later, uh, Rosa comes over and she said she doesn't trust Mason and then well, the lawyer friend comes over and says that she, he's been checking out the courthouse and the police station, and there's not really any talk at all about any witnesses or that Santa, Santana was seen with a gun. No. So Santana thinks she might know why I, Mason would lie. I think Santana realizes now that Mason's making way more out of this than he needs to. And I think Rosa actually says to her, she says, do you think he's just doing this to frighten you? And uh, Santana kind of has a knowing look on her face. So, mm -hmm. I think, so I think that. that'll, yeah. Yeah, that'll continue for as things progress. Meanwhile, uh, Kelly and Peter have managed to dock at the marina and the music plays as Kelly and Joe see each other. We always know when they're going to see each other. And then they go to commercial, and then they came back, and the music started from the beginning again, and Kelly and Joe saw each other for about five seconds, and then... Their eyes met, The I think. next time yeah. we saw them, the music started, and they saw each other again. So uh, Peter was kind of annoyed when he realized that uh, Ted was there, and dra or that uh, Joe was there and dragged... Dragged uh, Kelly back into the yacht and asked, uh, Oh, how does he look to you? Because he's obviously thinking, Yeah. Kelly's still in love with worried. Joe. A little bit worried. So, I don't know, Peter. And meanwhile, poor old Joe suddenly finds himself confronted with CC and a couple of thugs. CC tells him to get out of town. He says again he's going to find the real killer. and. CeCe leaves and the thugs toss him into the water. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see, he had threatened that the thugs were going to take him straight out of town, so I guess he av avoided that because yeah. he later shows up uh, at his mom's house um, just after the bomber has thrown a bomb through their front window. So uh, Joe's ringing the bell, and the mom comes out and sees the bomb, and it goes off. Yeah. But uh, she doesn't seem to be too badly injured. Joe goes in and pulls her out. Fire engines come. They put up the, put out the fire. And then a mysterious figure shows up and whispers that Joe needs to meet him at midnight at some abandoned factory or something. So that is an unexpected turn of events. Joe also had uh, an interesting dinner companion. That's right. In between those two things, he managed to go to the, what I think might be the State Street Bistro, mm -hmm. although it hasn't been named yet, and uh, Augusta Lockridge comes in, pretending not to recognize him, I believe. Yeah, they kind of introduce themselves to She and Breeze other. come in, Yeah. and he kind of defends her uh, against the waitress, who wants the dog out, and then uh, she suddenly says, oh... Kind of look familiar. I've yeah. seen you in the news. She's playing it cool. Yeah, so, yeah. anyway, they have a chat about you know how he's innocent, and she's like, "Well, you know, I may not be like everyone else who thinks you're guilty, and they have an open mind." So, yeah. there's uh, there's an opening there, but we know that she almost killed him two episodes earlier. So, I think she's uh, using a keep your enemies closer tactic there, so that she can. Maybe find out how close he is to finding the real killer. But we did find out that they don't know each other directly from that scene. No, they had yeah. never met before. Yeah. So in fact, he uh, he mentions the name Warren Lockridge as someone he's he sort of knows, but yeah. not very well. Yeah, he's so familiar with the name. They were at school together. That's or, what I thought. Maybe they had like gone to high school together or something. So it's interesting that when he was dating Kelly Capwell, the Lockridges weren't really on his radar. For no, that. no. Um, the Lockridges themselves have lunch, and the topic between Augusta Lakin and uh, Warren is Lakin's having a boy in her room because the gardener has reported to Augusta that uh, someone had climbed up and broken the trellis. And, yeah, that's and how they're found out. She admits that it was Ted Capwell, mm -hmm. which doesn't go that well. And then Augusta so slowly realizes he must have been in the room at the time when yeah. she was there and that he was hiding under the bed. So Lincoln says, well, I'm having a date with a nerd tonight, and I promise I won't let him under my bed. Yeah. So... And uh, later on, she's on her date with the nerd. Yeah. And it turns out Ted's in the back seat, and the nerd is Ted's friend. And it was all tricked to get Lakin away from the Lockridge house without them realizing that she was on another date with Ted. And we, we kind of got to see the quirky, quirky side of Ted in this episode, because it turns out it, the, first, the first scene he's in, he's busy balancing a tennis racket on his chin. And uh, it turns out he is a pigeon enthusiast. And he and Danny send messages to each other via pigeon. This is, of course, before cell phones. So, so Danny sends a, a message about tomorrow being the big day for his yeah. stunt. And, uh, and uh, then Ted sends a letter back about, probably about Jade, I think it was. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Danny wanting to be the next Eric Estrada. Eric Estrada gets name-checked several times in this episode. Yeah. So after the Lockridge lunch, uh, Jade and Danny are having lunch at the same restaurant, and Warren's still there, but he's at a different table by himself now. Yeah. And uh, Jade's kind of looking at him, and also talking to Danny about trying to be in the movie, and then Warren comes over and teases Danny a bit, and... I was getting very mixed signals from Jade, as I think Jan Danny was too, mm -hmm. because on the one hand, Warren comes and, and sits at the table next to them, and, and Danny wants to leave, and, and Jade says, oh no, I'm comfortable here, I, I like being basically around Warren. But then whenever Warren makes fun of Danny, she jumps in, she says, oh, Danny's my hero, so don't say anything against him. So she's kind of 
playing both sides here. I, I don't think Danny knows how to read her, and I don't know how to read her either. Mm -hmm. When she's talking with Danny about different uh, different ways she could be famous in the future, mm -hmm. she could be on People Magazine, and then she goes off on a dynasty related tangent because yeah, she says so uh, Joan dynasty. Collins is on People Magazine, and I could be the next Joan Collins, only fifty years younger. Yeah. So, so this. Uh, that definitely the writers have Dynasty in their minds while watching they this definitely show. Do. While writing the show. So. And then uh, Santana uh, having told Rosa that she really is going to start looking at trying to get her baby back. Yeah. She goes directly to CC and tells CC the same thing that he's uh, that she's uh, she's thinking of. Uh, of getting the baby back. She first tries to get into Channing's room. Mm -hmm. uh, she says to Cece, it's just because he wants to, she wants to remember him. And Cece says the room hasn't been opened since the day he was killed, so maybe there's some evidence in there about who really killed yeah, him that's been may, locked away all these years. Maybe kind of wonder what was in that room. Mm -hmm. And does Santana have something in there that she wants to get? Yeah. So, and then Cece, um, Cece basically says, well, there's no way you can find your son because in by law, adoptions have to be sealed. Yeah. And uh, so there's no way they would let her find the baby. So she leaves, still determined to find her baby. Mm -hmm. He goes to the study and pulls out a drawing in crayon by, yeah. let's say, a five-year-old boy. Named Brandon, I named think Named Brandon. And then he picks up the phone and calls... Probably Acapulco, I don't know, and don't. Uh, asked to speak to Gina, and he asked Gina how their boy is, and, uh, and that she misses that, Brandon. That he hadn't he talked to them for a few days, so we know he's in constant contact with what we assume to grandson. be Santana's son. And uh, mentions that Brandon's birthday is coming up, so I guess if he's, I guess if he was born just after... Channing was shot, then that means I guess she was quite pregnant in that first scene that we saw, even though I guess I didn't really realize that. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah, it seems odd that she would be hiding it at that late date. But Maybe her little maid outfit didn't reveal very much. Mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, at the secret midnight meeting, the uh, mysterious stranger he seemed uh, very petite to me. A petite stranger with yeah. a beard and, and a hushed voice tells Joe not to turn around mm -hmm. and um, says that he wants to help Joe find the real killer mm -hmm. and that he needs Joe to trust him and then sneaks off before Joe can reply. So I think there'll be a lot more of these one-minute meetings coming up as Joe or the stranger tries to decide if if Joe trusts them and vice versa. So. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a recurring theme. Throughout mm -hmm. the, I don't know if it'll last, how long it'll last, but I think it'll last for a while. So, now Joe's already got got a potential lead on the real killer, so makes you wonder why the mysterious stranger didn't show up at the trial. Mm-hmm. Or at any point during the five years since the trial. And whether the mysterious stranger is actually trying to help Joe, or if they're trying to lead him further astray, maybe there's some nefarious reasons this stranger wants Joe to be following a particular trail. We don't they know could yet. be working for Augusta. They yep. could be the real killer. Could be Augusta. It they... was a very petite person. I guess we will find out. So this episode we had, I guess, in the last episode we had Warren introduced, and mm -hmm. in this one we have Mysterious Stranger introduced. So we're still meeting meeting uh, the cast members. And I noticed um, when Joe rescued his mother from the bomb, he, she said something like, oh, thank goodness Jade and Amy weren't here. Oh, that's right. We and hadn't we heard, hadn't about heard Amy of Amy before. before, so that's someone else we have to meet. That's true. 
I think we've covered everything that happened this time around. I think I, so. I forgot to mention in the, the last episode that um, Ted had mentioned San Ysidro Creek, oh. which didn't sound yeah, that, that meaningful. Yeah, I that completely... But mean. the reason that it was so noteworthy for me 35 years ago is because on July 18th, 1984, there had been a massacre at a McDonald's in San Ysidro, California. Oh, wow. And that, you know, two weeks earlier. And that's the first time I'd heard of the name San Ysidro at all. Yeah. And so it was kind of shocking two weeks later to hear it just mentioned, you know, on the show. But San Ysidro, oh, wow. California is near San Diego. So uh, they're not, re- I doubt it's related to San Ysidro Creek, because that would be a very big creek. But uh, yeah. probably named after the same saint, I guess. I guess so. So I just thought I would... Mention that now, because it'll be never relevant again. (laughs) Probably not. And on that note, we'll say goodbye until after we've watched episode five. Hi, and welcome to Misha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. Week one, episode five. Original air date, August 3rd, 1984, and we watched it August 3rd, 2019. Well... Let's start with a few things we forgot to mention last time uh, that we talked about after the podcast and realized we hadn't mentioned. First of all, Joe finally got a new shirt. Yes, that's right. I hadn't particularly noticed it, but Diane pointed out he was wearing his prison shirt for the first few episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now he's switched from a prison blue shirt to a, um, a different blue shirt. Yes, he had a plaid shirt and, uh, in In today's episode, very exciting, he actually switches to a brown shirt. Um, And there was a mention by Lakin that the feud goes way back. Yes. So that was, uh, they talked about Cece's father and grandfather being uh, involved in the feud. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that possibly Minx is old enough to know the, the origins of. Um, Also, we forgot to mention that Mason had teased Peter about his job at the hotel. I think he had sort of offered him a low-level uh, low level role as assistant manager at a hotel, is what it sounded like to us. So Yeah, Mason made it sound like Peter would probably be offered a role as the front desk clerk or, or something like that. And this is the first that we've heard that the Capwells also own a hotel. So yes. there's the Capwell Hotel as well as at least one oil rig number 29. Yeah. All right, and that was a wrap-up for what we forgot last time. So now into episode five. And uh, the first thing that happened was John found out about the bomb. Uh, John showed up at home, mm-hmm. found out about the bomb, did a lot of arguing with Marissa, and said basically it was too dangerous for Jade to live there and wanted Jade to live with him. Yes. Um, I think Joe came in briefly, they argued, and left again, so... John basically came in and was unpleasant, as he has been in most of his appearances, and left. Um, now Tad and Lakin spent the whole time basically hanging out with Jade and Danny and flirting. Yep. So I think they fantasized about possible futures at one point. I think there was a lot of that in this episode by various people. Um, at one point, Cece suggested that uh, Ted might want to go to military school which freaked him out, Mm because he obviously doesn't want to spend his senior year away from Lakin. No. Or or in military school. Or in military school. And then later on in the episode, when Danny was talking about going to Hollywood, Ted uh, joked he might go with him, and uh, Lakin didn't take too kindly to that thought, that he was going to leave No, no. So he kind of backpedaled that that pretty quickly. Uh, On the Danny and Jade front, Danny did his stunt for the director, and it was perfect on the first first take Mm -hmm. to which Jade said you may kiss me now (laughs) (laughs) so uh, Jade has had some good lines yes he didn't really take her up on it though yeah so that's he he said not right now or or later or something like that yeah 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 I'm not sure what's going on there so we'll we'll see and Jade is still angling to get her shot in Hollywood too that was an ongoing thing this Mm -hmm. story as well yeah, uh, Jade asked Danny later in the episode if he'd talk to the director, uh, and uh, Danny basically had introduced Jade to the director, 
and uh, I guess the director basically said hi to her and didn't want to talk to her yeah, any further. Yeah. So, so I don't think that that's uh, going to go anywhere. But maybe she's hoping if they go to Hollywood for the summer, she'll meet some other casting director. So. Yeah. Um, Danny did ask his parents if he could go to Hollywood, so we met Ruben Andrade for the first time. And he was kind of as gruff as Rosa said he was going to be. And that was that was kind of a, a fun scene because Danny, they were in the restaurant and Danny was sort of negotiating with his parents at one table. And then at the other table, all of his friends, so Ted and, and Lincoln and Jade were... And the sitting, nerd boy. And the nerd were, uh, were sitting there watching and, and trying to figure out if he was succeeding in convincing his parents or not. Now, Peter uh, was offered uh, the job by CC, assistant manager of Capital Hotels. Mm -hmm. So there's now a hotel chain involved. And so assistant manager of a hotel chain, uh, chain now actually sounds like it is a good yeah. uh, good position. And he settled in and uh, he met with one of the other executives who, who mentioned that I think Ronald Reagan was coming to town mm -hmm. and he would be in charge of handling the... Uh, uh, the rooms for that. So, uh, and then Peter settled in with his dictation machine to detect, di uh, dictate his resignation letter to Lyman Prep. And uh, I thought that that might be a little bit ominous. Yes. Because it kind of seems to me like the job is predicated on the fact that he's marrying Kelly. Yes. And the, we, absolutely. We know from millennia of fiction that the universe wants uh, Kelly and Joe together. So I think Peter's life may, uh, you know, has a potential of collapsing in several ways all at once, um, which is possibly a potential future cause of friction between Peter, Flint, and the Capwells. Peter seemed to settle in actually really quickly to his, his new job. So I kind of had a little bit of a sense he was already getting a little bit of an attitude. I, I think he's settling into to being a, a wealthy Capwell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Santana is already booking uh, herself a plane to Acapulco. Mm -hmm. She's on standby for a ticket that evening. Yes. Um, Mason comes over to invite himself for dinner, and uh, I guess she decides that she might get some revenge on him, so she agrees. And then when Rosa comes over, uh, she points out that Santana's leaving all of the seeds in the chilies. So... Um, they they say she was making roast lamb or roast veal, I think, but I don't know if that has a lot of chilies in it, but that's what they said. So. Meanwhile, Mason is fantasizing about a future where he's with Santana, and she says that he's much better than Channing, and why did she waste all those years? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, in the fantasy, Mason's running for governor, or is the governor. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's, you know, we have a sense of Mason's plans for himself. Um, so anyway, uh, Mason does come over and takes a bite of the peppers and clearly can barely manage to keep it down because it's so spicy and she ends up uh, taunting him by offering him more. So I found the um, whole thing with um, Santana and Mason was really fun. Um, when Mason and Santana were originally on the phone when they were arranging this dinner, and he was making all these sort of comments that he obviously thought were impressive, and she wasn't impressed at all. And so she was making all these faces while she was on the phone mm -hmm. and kind of rolling her eyes. He said, oh, I managed to get the charges dropped. And of course, she already yeah. knew that they were fake, so. Yeah. And I really actually enjoyed his little fantasy sequence. Uh, he's obviously lusted after Santana for a really long time, and he was imagining her sort of groveling to him and I thought that was a really interesting fantasy because it shows us a lot who Mason is. She just spends the whole episode, the whole fantasy groveling. He doesn't really say anything. He's just looking off into the mid distance and fantasizing about being talking a little bit about being governor. But it's obvious from watching this fantasy that not only um, does he want Santana but that power is really important to him as well. So he doesn't just want Santana, he wants her to be 
um, groveling to him and acknowledging him as as her her right choice. Yeah. And even after five years, he's still got a yeah an issue with Channing. So. Yeah, exactly that. It showed that too. So meanwhile, uh, back at the mysterious meeting place where Joe was meeting the uh, mysterious informant. Um, the informant had, had walked off at the end of the last episode, having heard a noise, but, uh, but Joe called uh, them back, and they, uh, they said, well, don't try to find out who I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were talking about who might, have set, who might have set the bomb. And Joe said he thought that Cece did it. But the uh, mysterious person says that that didn't make any sense, mm -hmm. that Joe should really think about who might, who might have it in for him and who would do such a thing. Um, and then Joe mentions uh, the other witness, the person that went to the library with him, mm -hmm. that discovered Channing uh, with him, and that vanished before the trial and never testified on his behalf and hasn't been seen. Yeah. So this is um, this is another good clue towards towards the the murder mystery of, of uh, and I, I, I'm thinking that Dominic may be the other person, right? Because Dominic yeah. seems to be. The witness um, seems to have witnessed it in some way, or knows that. Yeah. Um, so um, Joe then goes uh, to the they they end their meeting, and Joe goes to meet Augusta accidentally, possibly on purpose. Mm -hmm. And Augusta, listening to his his woes, just offhandedly says, oh, "It might be better for you and your family if you left Santa Barbara," which mm -hmm. is, of course, her whole thing. So now that makes me think, did, did Augusta maybe pay someone to throw a bomb into the Perkins house? Yeah. So, that's a potential. Um, Joe almost immediately gets a note, and uh, it's from the mysterious stranger, who finally says, okay, call me Dominic. Uh, so, and um, says, do not trust Augusta. Mm -hmm. So, Dominic, Dominic must know a lot about Augusta. Yeah. So. And, um, and I guess to really this episode, apart from that, just we saw little shots of her here and there sort of skulking around with her dog, and that seems to be a lot of what she does. Mm -hmm. But it seems like she's concerned about Joe. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, of, of potential suspects for mm -hmm. who could be the real killer, really Augusta's been acting the most suspicious, right? She, yes. She, she tr tried to keep Joe out. She's trying to get him away, and she's also been kind of finding out, just through his through questions, what he knows or yeah. if he has any leads and things like that. So, so right now, I think she's a good suspect. Um, so, after thinking over what Dominic said, to uh, you know, to, to think through who might have it in for him, mm -hmm. he actually sneaks into the Capwell Hotel and goes to see Peter. Yeah. And uh, they have a bit of an argument, but he mentions that Peter was after Kelly five years ago and that he was trying to break up Joe and uh, Kelly for his own purposes way back then. So This is the first time we really realized that Joe and, and Peter actually have a history together as well. Mm -hmm. So now we have another potential suspect because, yeah. you know, Peter... If Peter's been hanging around the family and been interested in Kelly for that long, yeah. he may have wanted to get rid of Joe to get Kelly, and, you know, he may have had issues with, with Channing, maybe over that same topic or something else. So, if he was a teacher at school, he may have uh, had Channing as a student. So. Or, and Kelly, too, possibly. I don't know how old she would have been five years ago. Yeah. Probably would have been just graduated from high school or None something. None of them really look like they've aged one in five years. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mm. Um, so I think that that was pretty much it for that, that scene. And then Joe, uh, next time we see Joe, he's uh, at a phone booth, and he uh, calls Peter on the yacht, mm -hmm. where he and Callie are spending the, the uh, evening having dinner, and uh, disguises his voice and pretends he's Peter's new neighbor, mm -hmm. and that he saw... He saw someone uh, go into his apartment and was thinking that it might be, uh, you know, a burglar. So he he 
he says, I'll call the police. And then Peter, uh, Peter, of course, then doesn't have a reason to call the police, but Peter leaves to run to his apartment, leaving Kelly alone on the boat. Mm -hmm. So Joe's payphone is actually at the marina, and as soon as Peter leaves, yeah. Joe makes his way onto the, the boat. Just uh, as Kelly is putting a tape into the uh, stereo, and for a second I thought it might be people Bryson's if ever you're in my arms again, but it we wasn't. We did hear that. Uh, but only seconds later, as she's thinking about Joe, and Joe enters the room and she sees him, the uh, strains of <laughs> if ever you're in my arms again yeah. begin. So we've heard the start of that song. We've heard a lot. Several times, yeah, we but we haven't heard a long stretch of it. Really. No, no. So we haven't heard the whole thing. So we've just heard that those beginning first through. If few they're bars, trying to get us to buy the album, they really need to play. Yeah. More of that song. So. And I think that was how you know how it ended with, uh, with Joe and Kelly on the yacht. So they finally, after five episodes, managed to be in the same room together. And Kelly, this just you know. Uh, an offside, is actually wearing a dress that's very similar to one that I had in the early 80s. Mm. So that was a nice blast from the past for me. Well, Mason's just been wearing suits the whole time, mm -hmm. so I think I might have to dig up a photo of myself with uh, Mason Capwell's hair and a similar suit that I <laughs> <laughs> might have had taken in the mid-80s. Well, I'm wearing a shirt from the 80s right now. This isn't a pajama top. This is actually a real shirt that I found in my uh, mom's trunk that is from 1986. So it's just two years older, or sorry, two years newer than, than the show we're watching. Um, and just talking about a list of suspects, I'm thinking Mason is a potential suspect too, because mm -hmm. we know he had issues with Channing. And he, although he didn't instigate a lot of the stuff against Joe, he was kind of doing it under Cece's direction, but he was kind of given free reign. So so I think we've got three, I would say, suspects. Augusta, Peter, and Mason. And I suppose Dominic is a potential suspect, too. You know, if you don't think that Dominic is trying to help, then that's a potential suspect too. But yeah, it's I, still I not clear whether Dominic's entirely trying to help or if he's trying to mislead or distract him. Yeah, them. because of the secrecy, don't try to find out who I am or follow me or whatever. Oh, oh and don't try to tell the police about me, yeah. something like that. Um, Dominic really wants to remain anonymous, but, you know, but he, he's else. not wrong about uh, Augustus. Or Augusta either. Yeah, so. so we know that Augusta's sneaky. Yeah. So it, it seems to, it seems to me, even with just what we've seen, that Dominic probably is hoping to help and and will put Joe on the right path. Yeah. This week's spotlight is on Robert Brian Wilson, who played Channing Jr. on Santa Barbara. Wilson was born in 1962 in Cerritos, California. He's been married to his wife, Michelle, since 1995, and they have three children. Before Santa Barbara, he'd appeared in the horror movie Silent Night, Deadly Night. After Santa Barbara, he made appearances in Generations, Matt Houston, 30-something, Knott's Landing, Perfect Strangers, Jake and the Fat Man, and one of the Gunsmoke reunion movies. He appeared in one episode of Dynasty as Tony. He is the first of three actors to have played Channing Jr. The other two were infants. He played Channing twice, once in 1984-85 during the Who Killed Channing murder mystery storyline, where he appeared in flashbacks and still photos that took place in 1979. He returned to the role for three episodes in 1991. His most recent acting credit is from 2016, and he now works in the trade show business. So that was the spotlight on Channing Jr. Very informative. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing that because who knows how much longer uh, we'll be seeing them. So mm. I thought I'd better do them first. And that is it for week one. Do you have anything else uh, you want to summarize or predictions for the future? No, no, I don't. Predictions for Danny's career as a <laughs> stuntman? Well, I don't know if he will end up being a stuntman or the next Eric Estrada. I guess that's something we'll have to, to find out. 
Um, he seems to be pretty capable at hand gliding, but I don't know how he'd be at falling out of buildings or whatever else stuntmen do. Now, around this time on Another World, every time summer rolled around, all of the teen characters would be in bathing suits for most of the summer. Mm. Uh, so if they go to Hollywood, they might end up uh, not having as many mm -hmm. bikini scenes as the producers might want. But then there is a beach in Hollywood, so... Oh, yeah. I mean, they really need to suck in the young viewers uh, early on, so that's their that's their goal. And uh, murder mystery wise, I don't think there's it's. I think it's too early to predict who really the killer is. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we'll find out. Yeah. And um, Joan Kelly. End game. Sounds good. All right, we will see you next week for week two of Santa Barbara. See you then.